So let me, let me uh, uh, say a few things and what I've got. I'm getting way off track, but uh, I, hope, I hope this will be okay, and I've got to change glasses. I'm at that age in my life where I'm carrying around glasses all the time, different, different strengths. Um, okay. So let's put up step by step through the Book of Mormon. And let me show you just sort of how it works. Uh, and let me tell you, this is, we're still in development on this. Uh, and it's a process. And it's not, it's, it's made for study purposes. If we issue it, it will be issued through the organization non-profit organization it will not it's not made for profit because it involves a lot of people and a lot of people's work with because it's a collection of commentary and I'm not going to rewrite what they said and I'm not going to interpret what they said I'm just going to give you a snippet of what they said and I'm going to show you I'm going to give you the title of their book and then leave it up to you to go to that book or to collect that article okay and the same goes for the illustrations. Now, in the text, um, sometimes by highlighting certain things in the text, we get an understanding because we see patterns. I've highlighted all of the geographical verses in the Book of Mormon in my own, I've got my own text on computer, and, and I've arranged it how I want to arrange it. And as I flip through the pages, there's a pattern. There are certain patterns that you see when you start to see colors. Uh, that's, you know, I like the, the idea of a computer, but the written page is great because, because you flip through and see patterns. You flip through and see words, cultural words. Put this down, write this down. In First Nephi, the book, there's a word or a couple of words that mean covenant. Look for the covenant setting. And the words are, I know. Every time you read those words, it's an allusion to the knowledge of covenant, which is different than intellectual knowledge. It's covenant knowledge. In, in, in chapter 3 of 1 Nephi, Nephi, everybody knows this verse. It's, I will... I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them. Everybody says, oh, that's a nice illustration of simple faith. It has nothing to do with simple faith. Nephi is telling you, I know. Well, how does he know? Well, read the previous chapter. The previous chapter says, I want to know what my father knows. And so he says, I went and I talked with the Lord. Well, did he just go out and pray? No, he talked with the Lord. And then in the next verse, he says, The Lord told me that if I obeyed his commandments, he would lead me to a land of promise. Okay. So he goes back to the tent of his father. His father says, Go get the plates. Laban has them. Laban's over armies. It's impossible to get them, but go get them. In other words, I don't know how you're going to do it. Everything says you're going to die. You've got to go back through the wilderness. You know, if the beasts don't get you, Laban will. Uh, and what did Nephi say at that point? He says, I will go because I know. Because he had just come from talking with the Lord. The Lord had promised him. He knew that the Lord was bound. He didn't know the answers, but he knew the Lord was bound. And so you have the story and then when, and there's a zillion things to the story that talk to you about covenants, if you will read them. Uh, but he comes back, and when his father sees him, his father says, now I know that I have obtained a land of promise. Well, what's he talking about? They're in the Valley of Lemuel. They're by the Red Sea. They're not over in America. How does Lehi know that he has obtained a land of promise? Well, you're talking about a covenant story. 
Every story in the Book of Mormon is about covenants. If you understand the process, and Mormon has inserted culture and geography to tell you about that. You just have to ask the questions. You just have to seek. And, and the Lord will, if you obey his commandments, the Lord will unlock the answers to you. Okay. So, all right, we have the text. Let me get my other glasses. Okay, and you can see um, in the text that I've highlighted the names of the people in the Book of Mormon and the places in the Book of Mormon the first time that they show up in the text. And I've highlighted the geographical phrases and I've highlighted the covenant phrases and these are color-coded in, in uh, a different a different text. Can you flip to that different? Well, we'll flip to the commentary and switch it. But uh, there are times when you can flip, flip to the, the text. And uh, uh, but uh, by pointing, okay, just let's see if we can. This highlights volume one, two, and three. It, it highlights basically the themes of what's going on. That. The Lord leads his covenant children through the wilderness to the promised land. That's basically the message. The second message is the Lord provides a covenant plan of salvation. And the Lord delivers his children out of bondage through covenant. The Lord redeems his covenant children. These are the stories. Okay. So if we can get if, if we can get the, the scriptures on the left side. We're having trouble with that. Well, let me just tell you. Okay, thank you. Let me just tell you that this is interactive, uh, and you can move from from uh, headings of summaries of what's going on to the chapters. And, and the words are highlighted in different colors. And when you, when you click on those, you can click over to a commentary. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, all right, thank you. Um, so as, he, as he's got the, the cursor there, he's clicking, and all of a sudden it brings up the commentary. Uh, and as we go through the commentary, scroll through the commentary, we will come, a, come, across, we will come across references to illustrations. Let's see if we can find the illustrations there. Uh, well... Anyway, as you read the text and as you, as you read the commentary, you will come to certain, um, uh, certain uh, identifications of, of illustrations. And, and uh, you can click on a button and that illustration will pop up. Um, that, uh, that last one uh, was basically what the, the city of Jerusalem would have looked like at the time of Lehi. Uh, Jeffrey Chadwick has done a paper on that uh, express some good ideas uh, so so that's in a way the reason that that I've tried to do it this way is because this commentary can be constantly expanded it can be constantly edited and changed and modified and enriched whereas you write a book and that book is on the shelves you have to you in order to break even you've got to print a lot of them and when you print a lot of them you've got to sell a lot of them and the, with the LDS book market the way that it is you're lucky to break even and you're lucky to break even in less than five years and sometimes 
with every book you sell, you go deeper in debt. Uh, especially when it comes to Book of Mormon geography because nobody's interested. Very few. And so with this, I can keep doing what I can do. I can leave this in the hands of other people. We can modify this. We can issue it on a per order basis. And so we don't, we don't lose money. We don't have to wait till a new edition. Uh, we can just keep modifying it and have it for people on, in their use uh, on the computer. Uh, as they study the Book of Mormon. And if they can get use out of it, great. Uh, that's, that, but it's for me, for me, it's the accumulation of what I've done. And it's the journey that's important for me. Uh, and it's the journey that should be important to you. Whether you use this or whatever you use, move forward in your knowledge, move forward in your search. <clears throat> uh, how many of you have gone to Book of Mormon lands? Okay. How many, how many of you have had the opportunity to go up to Huehuetenango and then go down into the Chiapas Depression to Santa Rosa? Okay. Have you ever looked back? What did you see when you looked back? You said, here we are in a proposed place for Zarahemla and you're looking back and you see this wall of mountains, the Sierra Cuchabatanes, and 10,000 feet rising. It's a wall. It's a barrier. It's a narrow strip of wilderness that separates the land of Zarahemla from the land of Nephi. It's never mentioned until people go into the land of Zarahemla. And then you hear of a narrow strip of wilderness. It took the sons of Mosiah many days to get through that narrow strip of wilderness. So how can a narrow strip of wilderness take many days to get through? It's all in perspective. Once again, did Mormon have a satellite picture? No, he was on the ground. So by traveling to Central America, and whether it's correct or not, by going from Huehuetenango down into the Chiapas Depression and looking back, you have received a perspective that nobody else has. And it can change the way that you think because it's real. And it could be. Doesn't mean that it is the narrow strip of wilderness, but it could be. And all of a sudden, the Book of Mormon becomes real. One picture is worth a thousand words. And when it comes to Book of Mormon geography, pictures are worth everything. So that pretty much is, have you been moving around in here? That's step by step. Okay, and regardless of what we have, I'm more interested in, in your process that you do the same things, that you mark your text, that you ask the questions, that you accumulate answers, and that you accumulate perspectives, illustrations, perspectives, charts, anything that will help you understand what's going on in chronology and whatever. And I've accumulated, I don't know, a few thousand pages of commentary and a few thousand illustrations. Uh, the process goes on. Okay, chronology. Let me, how many minutes do we have? Okay. All right. Yeah, just those, uh, yeah, just the, just, okay. This is the, uh, in, in, in organizing all of the statements that have ever been made. Uh, it's a massive work. I've got over 5,000 excerpts from different authors uh, in different categories from different perspectives. Uh, over 500 maps uh, of proposed areas for the Book of Mormon. 
but I found by grouping them into certain time periods, it allowed me to see development. And those time periods were centered around editions of the Book of Mormon, uh, major editions of the Book of Mormon, because cert at certain times, the church, when they put out a new edition, they would have committees meet, and these committees would study and decide, well, how are we going to format this? What are we going to emphasize? What are we going to do? And so it, caught, it was a time of reevaluation. Um, one of the times um, had to do with, with uh, um, the first edition of the Book of Mormon. In other words, what did people think? I mean, how did they, you know, what were their feelings? What did they think about the Indians? What did they think about America? Uh, because that's how they interpreted the book. Um, in 1879, Orson Pratt put some footnotes into the Book of Mormon, geographical footnotes, that represented a hemispheric theory. In 1920, at preparation for a new edition, and at the end of 1920, early 1921, um, they took out Orson Pratt's footnotes. In 1981, we had a new edition, and that caused reevaluation of things also. So those time periods are, are divisions. And within those divisions, these are the categories that, that are separate volumes so that people can see from the perspective how thought evolved, how thought changed. Uh, one of them has to do with Indian origins in the House of Israel. Uh, one of them has to do with the geography of Lehi's travels. I mean, what did they think at the beginning? And what, what was the reason for their thinking? Uh, and when did that change? I mean, we're all influenced to a certain extent by Hugh Nibley's books. Uh, Lehi in the Desert came out in 1952. And... Uh, in 1957, his studies were included in the Melchizedek Priesthood Manual, and the church studied them. So we're heavily influenced from the 50s by Nibley's ideas, and he had some great ideas. But George Potter has some better ideas, and George Potter lives in 2005, not in 1950. Uh, and George Potter has lived in Arabia, and so he's actually been there. And just like Joel Ricks, if he's actually been there, then maybe we ought to look at his map. Same goes with every one of those things. Uh, we have perspectives that I want to put people in their time. Uh, one of the things that I always remember in reading the histories of Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson as a great man, but there's controversies about uh, Thomas Jefferson. But one of the historians made a statement that, that has stuck with me. He said, sometimes we overly revere great men, and sometimes we do them a disservice by ripping them out of their time and circumstances. I think we need to remember that as we go back and evaluate the statements of church authorities that were outstanding men and good men, but, we'd, but we don't want to rip them out of their time and circumstances. And so my, my job here is to place them in their time and circumstances so that you can understand what they were saying. Uh, we've gone through George Q. Cannon's statement. There's many, many, many other statements that when we place them in the circumstance they were in, we understand what was going on, okay? Um, in order to evaluate, we need, um, we need uh, I've, I've added uh, basically biographies uh, of, of the LDS writers so that we know who they were, what they were all about. I've added a list of all of the periodicals from all of the different factions. I mean, the reorganized church. I've had 
some great help by different organizations and people all along the way. Uh, Joe Allen and his Book of Mormon tours, Dennis Moe from Independence, Missouri. Uh, he's in the uh, uh, restoration movement right now. The, the reorganized church has left him. Uh, they've left everybody, uh, basically. Became the community of Christ, and now I don't know where they're going. Uh, and neither do any of the, the people back there. Uh, it's a mess. Uh, but there are people that have a testimony of the Book of Mormon that are great, great people. And uh, Raymond Treat, uh, Dennis Moe, uh, you have some people that are devoted to the Book of Mormon. Neil Steed, back here, he addressed us yesterday. They might think differently in other doctrinal areas, but when it comes to the Book of Mormon, they, they know it's true. So these are areas uh, I've accumulated. Uh, we will be putting them on disk. Uh, and with the maps so that, so that that research can go forward. Our organization that I belong to is Ancient America Foundation. It's an extension. The first organization that began on Book of Mormon geography was the, the University Archaeological Society in 1949. 1961 it changed to SEHA. And, and then it changed in the 80s to Ancient America Foundation. Uh, it was the earliest. And, and we've, uh, the people involved, Garth Norman, Bruce Warren, uh, we have the libraries of Wells Jakeman, who was the founder. We have the libraries accumulated by, uh, that Garth Norman houses, that Bruce Warren houses. I have my library that's extensive. Um, and not for a valuable sake. In other words, I'm not interested in collecting an old book because of the value of the book. It's the information that's in it. And so wherever I can scan it or Xerox it, that's fine. It's the record. And we have that research, and our organization is in the process of merging with the Book of Mormon Archaeological Forum. And I would hope that those of you out there with means in anything would be a part of this merger would be a part of supporting the work. Um, there is an organization called Farms. It's a great organization. It has its niche. And so does BYU religion department and church educational system. They all have their niche. But believe me, and this comes from 20 years of intense research, there is a critical need for this organization to exist, the Book of Mormon Archaeological Forum, because of the perspective that it can give to other views and other perspectives. And I hope that you would look into your situations to help that, that process go forward. And I hope you would do what I've talked to you about as far as the Book of Mormon and your study and President Hinckley's challenge again. And I leave you with these words and I leave you with my testimony of the Book of Mormon that I know it's true. I have no idea what the answers are to a lot of questions, but I've received answers to dozens of questions, which makes me still a person of faith. And when it comes down to it, we are all people of faith because our, our whole existence revolves around a resurrection, somebody returning to life after they died that we have no scientific proof on never will. It's something that we have to accept on faith. I leave you with these feelings and this testimony, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
We're deeply grateful for uh, Alan's uh, explanation of something that Elder McConkie used to talk about. He said, uh, he said, when you study the Book of Mormon or any other piece of gospel doctrine, he said, just remember that half of your time should be studying, say, from page one to page 400 or whatever, and the other half should be studied in a thematic way. And this is the gift that he has. And in section 46, as mentioned by Brother Lund yesterday, that each person has different gifts, and we all need those gifts to be shared. And I, we thank Alan for having shared this gift today. He brought out that the, he, the, the words he used were thematic perspectives, and he, dis, he designated seven categories. In other words, our study by theme uh, helps us learn geometrically not just in a straight curve, but one that goes up, we learn faster and better. So we thank Alan very much for what he has done, helped us with today. <laughs>